fairy tales were told about them, adventures reported, expeditions conducted. No other landscape is so overwhelming and at the same time holds as many secrets as the desert. Sand seas are the first images that you imagine when you hear the word desert. But the fine sand covers only 20% of all deserts. Egypt, however, can boast that 40% of its share of the desert is covered with sand. The Sahara Desert is the coffee table book. Yellow sand seas pass by. Dunes know no national boundaries and migrate slowly but steadily across North Africa. The date palm oasis interrupts the arduous journey. A mirage appears in the distance. The Sahara Desert embodies the romantic notion of the lost dream of endlessness more than any other desert and had a lasting influence on 19th century Western culture. The Oasis of Siva, famous for the oracle of Amun-Re, is only 37 miles away from the Libyan border and is one of the most remote parts of Western Egypt. Only since the straight four-lane desert road from Marsa Matru on the Mediterranean was drawn through the Sahara, Siva is also accessible for non-caravans. Nine days of tribulations have been replaced by nine hours of flat, featureless land. There in lush green palm groves, between olive trees and orchards, our journey will begin. The vineyards cited in poetry are a thing of the past. Then suddenly, a hustle and bustle in the oasis, loud honking, donkey carts race behind mopeds or block the road. A chicken waits for its death at the grill. And here I am, like I had fallen here from another world. I have an appointment with Hamdi Mohammed Ali. The desert-tested Bedouin from neighboring Farafra will accompany me on my journey. We meet at a cafe in the center of the oasis. I want to enjoy Siva for one day and after that begin the journey through the Great Sand Sea. For starters, on wheels. The 29,000 Sivis are extremely devout and conservative Berbers, an exception in Egypt. They only marry within their own tribe. Women are shrouded in a black full body shroud, whether walking across the road holding their children or being carted away by their husbands on the back of a two, three, or four-wheel vehicle.
Beautiful water nymphs don't frolic like this in the bath of Cleopatra, but boys do have fun. Siva is situated on an underground aquifer, a freshwater lake, and the water bubbles up everywhere. And not just for the fun things. Artificial canals run through the city, and new pumping stations must be installed constantly and maintained. Natural water drainage is impossible because of the extreme depth of the underground lake. The coronation hall of Alexander the Great, who came to consult the oracle and took the mysterious response to his grave, along with the abandoned old town of Shali, are among the historical high points. As though made of sugar, the houses dissolved decades ago during a heavy rainstorm that lasted a mere 30 minutes a place of ghosts and dust. Agriculture has always been an important economic factor for the oases in the Libyan desert. In fertile siva, most of all, dates and olives. <laughs> Matem Ahmed explains. We cut the clusters with these machetes. The blades are hard and have sharp teeth. If we take this piece here, it cuts instantly. The blade must be very sharp. Once the knife is set, you pull it up. This is how you have to cut it, so that the clusters fall as a hole from the palm, and then, God willing, we gather the dates. Something you can only do in bare feet. The feet of the CV must be tough. Walking barefoot in the fields helps and covers the feet with calluses so they can stick to the palm branches. It is November. This month they will work hard in the palm garden. The ripe dates have to be harvested and sorted before they are processed and packaged in factories. They take a break for lunch together. The men have brought food from home and enjoy the view of the Salt Lake. <laughs> the garden where we are now belongs to Haji Mohammed Matam. God have mercy on him. He is our father. We are seven brothers, and we are right in the middle of the date harvest. <laughs> And while the men get back on the palms, the waiting drivers recuperate by taking a little nap. After the workers have left, visitors arrive at sunset, the magic hour.
Hamdi, Mahmoud, and Nasser carefully load up our cars. You cross into the most famous of all deserts, the Sahara, today with a four-wheel drive. The last caravan of traders passed this way more than 30 years ago. Outside the town center, we pass more lakes and swamps. They skillfully catch the wastewater and recycle what doesn't evaporate or become too salty. Besides the main source of income, farming, they are betting on tourism since the construction of the desert road. Ecotourism, a niche market, has become popular worldwide and the fastest growing segment of the tourism industry. We leave town in a convoy. A car by itself would be too risky. The driver might be stuck, the mobile phone may not have service, and no one just happens to drive by. The control points, once set up to help caravans with crossing the Sahara, have been nothing more than political checkpoints for a long time. Farafra is quiet. No real center, few restaurants, barely any cafes. Surprisingly, however, there is a museum. Bader, a resident artist in the Oasis, tirelessly changes and modifies his building. He created it to showcase his work. He carves from olive and palm wood shapes sculptures made of soft sandstone, creates figures with clay, and paints with sand. In addition to international exhibitions, Bader also invites students and tourists to attend workshops. Without exception, he finds his materials in the desert. I learned sand painting from experience. I like to try out new materials. Previously, I only painted with the four most common colors found in nature, brown, white, black, and yellow. But when I went into the desert and discovered the full palette of colors in sandstone, I collected it and brought it back. All colors are natural except for blue. I use white sand and blue oxide to make blue. The sand paintings of Bader and other artists will remain with me on my journey. Bader draws his inspiration from everyday life in the oasis. Farafra is a family village. Life takes place behind the thick walls or out in the desert. Only men appear in the public life of the town. These are all people I know from the oasis. You can see them as figures, as well as in the painting. These people are well known. This is Saeed Abu Hawash, and this one is called El Akrish. This is Sheikh Kamal. This is Abu Jabran. And this is Sheikh Mabruk Abu Ali. He is the grandfather of Hamdi. Hamdi's brother, Saad Muhammad Ali, invites us. He's out there in the New Valley, a region where water was found by deep drilling. 
he bought a considerable tract of land and built cooling pools for the hot water bubbling from the ground. In a few months, the first wheat will sprout. He shares the pleasure of the hot spring with family and friends. At first, I was the one who drove into the desert. But I found that I'm a better businessman, the one who can sell, show the goods, and talk. Hamdi made it more fun to plan the desert tours and to conquer the desert, and knows how to find his way. Sometimes, tourism can go well for a year and stop the next year. So I came up with the idea of agriculture. You should always have a plan B. So I decided for agriculture because in Farafra there are only two sectors, agriculture and tourism. I have applied with the mayor of Wadi Gadit for investment aid of 1,000 feden and 1,038 acres to build a farm with modern irrigation systems and organic farming. Saad has studied in Austria and Germany. Music at first, but then the homesick student changed to agriculture. How could the visionary have guessed back then that he would find enough water for agriculture? Even in the 80s, the desert was regarded as worthless territory. Meanwhile, 12,000 settlers from the Nile Delta followed the call of the government and settled in the New Valley Project. Like most men in the Near East, Saad feels committed to tradition, but he has lived in Europe. Can he reconcile the two ways of life? More than that, the Lord of the Oases also helps us to understand how life is lived in Farafra. I love my children, I love my parents, and I love the whole family. We all live together. Three brothers and their wives, my mother, and all our children live in one house to this day. I love living with the whole clan. I don't like individualization, that every man for himself. For me, it's most important to share life with each other, to get involved with my family. There's a proverb that says, one hand alone cannot clap, but two hands can make a noise. Although the new tourism businesses continue to support the traditional division of labor within the family, the women, parallel to food preparation, are taking their first steps outside. Every morning, 20 to 30 women meet in the NGO at Tahaya Alvi. A portion of the profits flow back into the women's organization for continued education and training, reading and writing, hygiene and health care. Self-organized, they are not yet beyond the control of men, but they manage to avoid taxation by the authorities. I am excited with the changes in our country. Yes, I'm glad, because now it is possible that my daughter can do what I could never do before. Among the Bedouins, a girl could not go out of the house or travel. When you work at home, you're imprisoned inside four walls. You see no one, except those who specifically come to visit you. The teacher Mufida Mabruk adds, and we have the advantage that we can earn something in the organization and that we learn something we can do in the future if we have to stay home, which benefits us and increases our income. We're happy when we meet. Yes, then we can see each other. We talk and eat together. Everything we do together, we are among ourselves. Money is not everything in life. Mobile phones stand ready to serve as the new keys to the future. The changes that this means of communication have enabled seem to me greater than the influence of television in the 60s. <laughs>
But to understand the Sahara, I have to travel back into its past. The 13 selected for our desert safari dromedaries, the one-humped Arabian camels, complain vociferously about the separation from their herd and their children. I learned that it's the females that carry our loads, that there is only one stallion in the stable to sire the entire next generation. Egyptian Bedouins don't ride their camels. In nine days, I am told, we would reach the next oasis, Dakhla. In the Sahara, haste plays no role. If you hurry, you only hurry to your death. And you will reach your destination with camels too. In the meantime, the animals of our little caravan have gathered together. Hamdi, the lord of the desert, tries to acquaint me with the remnants of the nomad way of life. The relationship between the Bedouin and his camel is a strong, stable, and close relationship that has traits of human friendship. For a Bedouin, a camel is everything in his life. But there are other non-Bedouins who butcher camels and even eat them. I myself could never slaughter a camel and eat it. The camel is my friend, my soul. My life in the desert is closely connected with the camel. I find my way in the wilderness by understanding it as part of nature. There are certain large rocks. There is the sun, the direction of the wind, if the wind blows from the north. There are a few marks and signs here and there, but mostly I'm moving, thank God, driven by instinct and my own inner feelings that tell me whether I'm on the right trail. Does the sand also help? Its consistency? Its taste? Why is the sand yellow? Trace elements of iron, almost all impurities, are encapsulated in quartz and reflect the light so that only the wavelength of yellow is visible. Does the size of sand grains also play a role? In the days ahead of crossing the desert slowly, I'll be able to philosophize about it. The sun dives into a sea of sand in a true spectacle of color from yellow and orange in the Libyan desert. Tomorrow morning, it will rise again over the Nile
In between lies a cold night with wind constantly blowing. Nothing but sand and stars all around us. I ask Hamdi what his feelings are in the desert. He doesn't want to answer while he's cooking. He notices that I'm cold and asks me to get closer to the open fire a yellow light blazing in the darkness of the desert. Some of the men are up before we are, and before they think about themselves or the animals, they thank Allah by praying to Mecca. There is something touching about it, something that's stronger than just a religion. It is the unity of being in nature. Three out of the four great world religions were created here in this desert. The Bedouin life is simple. Life itself should be easy, for a man may live with little. But that's the difference between people in the city and Bedouins, the people of the desert, who can survive on very little. I start the morning with joy, because that makes me strong and the day will go well. Besides, what more could a man wish for when he looks at the desert? In the city, you want a bigger house, a car, a plane ticket. You want, want, want. Here in the desert, a man wants nothing. You look around and see the sunrise and sunset, the stars and the sand dunes, and nature. So then life is so simple. You don't need anything. A bit of food, water. Our Western idea of living well today but wanting a better life tomorrow doesn't find much resonance with Hamdi or his Bedouin colleagues. The good life in the here and now is enough. Indigenous people who use the environment but don't excessively exploit and destroy it won't shake our belief in progress, but we can learn from them. Our camels wander on. It is this steady, hypnotic rhythm that fascinates us. We guide them, but I'm sure they would find their way just as well alone, following the unseen path of their predecessors. We follow the well-worn and fading footprints of people who have traveled this way for thousands of years. 
Once again, I find the equivalent of the landscape in the sand pictures, the blurred lines, the lack of focus. What from a distance looks steep and sharp-edged looks soft and diffused up close. The sand is constantly in flux. For protection, dark, heavy particles, often slate, have covered the lighter quartz and limestone. A fascinating desert pavement has developed over long periods of time, which can be destroyed in seconds. At the side of the tracks, I'm glad to be journeying with the caravan. We go on through the dunes that rise and fall like waves of a stormy sea. From a distance, despite our 13 camels, we are only small dots in the middle of a huge yellow sand desert. How much effort it takes to build a house every night, a beautiful house, a windbreak with a fireplace, mattresses, and carpets. I admire my nomadic friends the fervor with which they assemble and disassemble a shelter. How much time each day is lost doing this? For Mahmoud Atala and his brother Nasser, it is neither a loss nor difficult. It's just a part of daily existence. We like the work. We love everything here. That's why we don't feel tired or any resentment. Then there are others we spend our time with here. We're a team, and for us it's not hard work. It's something that makes us happy. As for me, I know this life since I was a child, and I've always been on these expeditions. I'm accustomed to having everything I need with me. If anything is missing, it's like something is missing from us. The food, the mattresses, the drums, the harp, singing and all the fun. That's life in the desert. During the night, our small nomadic village gives us the illusion that there is life out there. The fire has warmed and illuminated the place. When we depart tomorrow and the wind has blurred the hollows in the sand, the site will revert to insignificance. And again, we walk on these grains of sand that were once big rocks. 
abrasion by continued erosion. Here, my concept of time gains a totally different dimension. Fossilized impressions of mussels in the rock remind us that millions of years ago, a great ocean heaved and fell in this desert. Fossils of sand dollars are scattered like treasures from the past in the gray-yellow sand. And snow-white limestone and Cretaceous sediments are assumed to be the last vestige of a shallow sea. Bones, some with fur and hair, warn how dangerous the trail can be. The immense nothing is scary. What if a sandstorm blows in, visibility is zero, and the seconds tick off waiting for drinking water? What if the sand is too loose to continue the trek? When you have time, you can fill in the picture. A sudden change in the landscape, a shiny metallic rock surface, millions of iron pyrite splinters and pyrite surfaces. Mountains dusted with pale yellow powder sand, landscapes that seem surreal. Our road is difficult, but incredibly beautiful. On the eighth day, my enthusiastic pace slowed. My feet hurt, and yet I want to continue. My guides have an idea. A narrow gorge, the only pass in the ancient caravan route, leads from the Karafish Mountains to the next oasis, Dakhla. Then finally, after many long and grueling days, the lush green oasis lies below us. Our camels pounce on the first fresh green shoots and leaves, and Humdi and I enjoy the natural shade of trees. I have grown quite fond of Scar, but now it's time to say goodbye.
In the Hotel of Saad and his brothers, we find shelter and a cozy, family-run, eco-friendly tourist business. Dakhla is sheer beauty, an oasis in the form of a one-street town. It is 50 miles long. 17 sub-oases are strung together. Amid the ruins, I run into Bushra Radha Yosef, who has a television, refrigerator, a wife and children, amid the ruins. There are no neighbors, no one. We are the only ones here. Since the earthquake, long ago in the 60s, no one has built or torn down anything. I saw how people moved away and settled away from here, but I have never seen anyone come back. We have settled here and don't want to leave this place. We like the simplicity, the calm, and could never leave this place, not even if someone out there would give me a villa. The guardian of ruins lures me through the crumbling mud walls of his domain. I follow him, the silence of a morgue, home of the dead. I come up here to shoot pigeons. Hunting has been my hobby since I was little. What I shoot is not for sale. It comes home to the table. I hunt here, and if a stranger comes, I ask him where he wants to go and where he comes from. And if he doesn't come from here, I have to ask him about the reason for his visit. Nothing more and nothing less. Is Bushra's loneliness up here to be understood as a reflection of his social isolation? They are cops surrounded almost entirely by Muslims. A fast car now replaces our slow camels, but it is much more prone to break down. While the padded soles of the camel feet, which were like soft leather, gently touch the surface of the sand, the wheels of the car dig in here and there. Into the hills of heaven, into Our team is constantly busy lowering and raising the tire pressure, as only a soft tire makes it on the fine desert sand. For me, it's all the same. How do our drivers know when the surface is soft or hard? Would I, if I were clueless behind the wheel, get hopelessly stuck? Jagged rocks cut our tires brutally, but also the frequent tire changes can't spoil the mood of our tour guide, driver, and cook.
Ain Saru is a mini oasis on the road to the White Desert. The bubbling, cold, fresh water used to be a popular stop for caravans. Today, the uninhabited oasis with the English name Magic Spring attracts tourists. If I'm the tour guide, I am responsible. But this time I have the feeling I'm coming along to play, as if I was really making a normal trip. I'm always happy when we move from one place to another. Even if I spend two or three months here, I don't get bored. People say, it's too hot for you, you are young, there is no television, no this and that. I'm happy, I tell them, come and see. My TV is the world around me. Come and see it for yourselves. Mahmoud is also active for environmental protection in the White Desert. He trains guides and drivers to not use a fragile site as a dump or a racetrack. The White Desert was discovered for tourism only 30 years ago. In 2002, it was declared a national park. A bizarre world of dazzling white limestone sculptures, as though shaped by hand and arranged in poses, cones, domes, and cathedrals as remnants of ancient cities. Or even a chicken, heads, dwarves. Our last night, we find shelter in a cave. Hamdi places candles in wall niches to illuminate the dark. Nasser and Mahmoud get out their instruments one more time. For me, music is for the quiet moments in life, for peace of mind. Through music, I forget all my worries. I enjoy sitting in the round and the happiness. I don't like the silence and the stillness. We have discovered our music together. Of course, I remain his big brother, but the collective music making prevents any cramping of our relationship. Between older and younger brothers, there is sometimes shyness and timidity, so they don't normally sing for each other. We both prefer the fresh air life. And, as the saying goes, on the carpet, everything is permitted. The singing goes on for hours. Glasses with sugary tea are emptied, filled, and emptied. Stories are sung. Our journey across the Sahara has come to an end. The airplane carries my body home fast, but my soul still lingers in the magic and the rhythm of the Yellow Desert Dream. The Grey Mojave is an endless, wrinkled, mountainous landscape with large stretches of gravel and little sand. It is jagged, a windswept desert. 
Its pale gray can darken intensely or change like a chameleon, depending on the color of the season and the daylight. When we think of gray, we think weak illumination. We associate the color with a lack of warmth and dull. The Mojave can be cold in winter, unlit in the night, and appears dirty, as the minerals in the crushed rock, gravel, and sand are not yet weather beaten, not yet washed out from the stone. Everything can be included in gray. Copper, manganese, uranium, and mica. Everything on display is visible on the artist's palette in Death Valley. From the light gray breaks, a true fireball of pastel colors. Pink, green, azure, brown, silvery white, and violet. If we increase the magnification of the gray sand, we get a similarly multicolored image. The Mojave is sparsely populated. Even though three million people live there, large cities have emerged in specific areas, Las Vegas, Palm Springs, and Lancaster fashionable resorts and pensioners' paradise. I'll ignore these because humankind has stepped in and stolen the land from the desert. My journey heads out into the wide open desert. Situated on the leeward side of the Sierra Nevada, a mountain range that blocks the moist air coming from the Pacific, and the summer temperature rises to 106 to 113 degrees. Occasionally, an abandoned gas station lurks on the roadside. Rusty metal billboards creak, or a house falls into disrepair.
remains of a spa and a beach resort from the 1950s in the abandoned region of the Salton Sea, the largest lake in the United States that is actually drying up. The investors had promised an American Riviera, but a disastrous chain of bad planning, continuous flooding and silting, and increasing salinity of the giant puddle without a drain made a ghost town out of a boom town. What the future of the Salton Sea will be, no one can predict. It may disappear one day as suddenly as it appeared. Money has become scarce, especially for studies and environmental issues and low-income regions. Millions of dollars have already been poured into the controversial aid program. Billions would be needed. One after another, the nostalgic charms of the 50s are disappearing. California. This is a little hotter than what I'm used to down the, by the beach where I come from, but you, you know what a house costs right here? You know what I pay for the house? $18,000. $5,000 down, $500 a month for two years and a $1,000 balloon payment. And it's mine. You can't even buy a car that cheap, can you? I found a beautiful woman and she was adopted and her mom lives out here and lived out here back in the 70s when they had bars and they used to water ski and everything out here. But they had a big like hurricane and a flood and it wiped everything out. And as you can see, everybody just kind of walked away from everything. I think it's gonna be a pop in place in the next five years. Like I say, 18,000 here or go to Riverside where it's 90 degrees, 95 and pay 365,000. I think that people will start moving out here pretty quickly. So that's my predicament. Because as times get harder, we got to save our money, right? Well, if the big earthquake comes, we're all going to kiss our ass goodbye and say, see ya up there somewhere. Or maybe down there. Hell, I don't know. You know? But yeah. Both are happy in Bombay Beach. And they are, as crazy as it may seem, not an exception in the Mojave, where this desert draws in the artist, outlaws, miracle believers, visionaries, UFO fans, and other eccentrics. Leonard Knight belongs among the most unusual inhabitants of this region. The hermit has created Salvation Mountain over a span of 45 years. 15 years ago, my old Chevy dump truck broke down here and I didn't have no gas to move, and I had no finances to build nothing, and people started to love me a little, and I started pounding the mountain here without a plan. And uh, 14 years later, I'm still here, and people are still coming in want to hear a love story about loving each other. He has worked tirelessly and transformed an inconspicuous mountain into a place of pilgrimage, an object of art, does he consider himself an artist? I never considered myself an artist, but people think I'm one. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that people love what I'm doing, and I'm glad that people respect what I'm doing, because the more respect I get, the more I'm gonna tell people is love God and love Jesus and let's respect everybody in the whole world. And... He was respected. Outside near Slap City, a former military base on whose slaps concrete foundations, outlaws park their mobile homes and set up drug labs. 
where graffiti and vandalism are on the daily agenda. This is my first 54 dump truck. 14 years ago, more or less before I came here, I spent 10 years making a hot air balloon, 200 foot high, and I wanted to put God's love on it. I have a one track mind. I want people to love God and God love people and I think it's happening. And it rotted out on me right here and I put the God is love mountain in the mountain. And I said, well, my hot air balloon didn't work. It rotted out, so I'm gonna have to do something different. It's not just a mountain he has adorned with hearts, flowers, and a waterfall, and on whose dome he erected a cross. It is a tribute to God. There are vaults, tunnel passages, and stairs, built from what the desert provided or what visitors and donors brought, paint, clay, and straw bales. A guardian angel watches over the offerings and recalls the early years. Here inside, like in a hogan or sanctuary, the memorabilia is protected from the bleaching sun. He painted and repainted his universe. In the desert, he found himself. The sparseness and the denial helped him gain a new feeling for life. Leonard dedicated his ascetic life to God. His truck never drove a single mile again, but it protected him from the biting cold or the scorching sun and wind of the extreme climate. I'd like to have you look in here. We both. Yeah, you young people can look. I'd love to have you open the door. And be real careful. I'd love to have you look in there. That was back when I was young and had ambition. And I really wanted to decorate everything. I ran into a tremendous lot of love and respect on people. People come in now by the hundreds, and I've never had one person get mad at me or anything. People just seem to love me, and uh, sometimes I'm kind of hard to love, but I'm working on it. While these eccentrics on the eastern shore of the lake eke out a gray, barren existence, in the northwest, lush green plantations spread out. Jasmine for perfumes, lemons, oranges, and especially dates. They often spill their over-fertilized and untreated sewage into the lake that has no outlet. One farm has specialized in medjool dates, which were once exclusive to the royal family of Morocco. The family that owns and operates Oasis Date Farm has set a new standard. They farm organically. Driving on anthracite-colored heaps of gravel in the lowlands of the Joshua Tree National Park, we reach the Jumbo Rocks, the huge granite rocks that originated in the subsurface magma, and finally, with the onset of the arid, dry climate washing out to the surface of the earth, they lay still. California is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire an active earthquake zone in which 75% of all volcanoes on our planet are located.
The granite shows very strange seams, which look almost artificial on the round stone, as though painted on as an afterthought. They are quartz veins. The plant that grows only in and is characteristic to the Mojave is the Joshua tree with its narrow, twisting arms. The second typical plant of the Mojave is the Choya cactus. Because from a distance it looks flush, it is also affectionately known as the teddy bear cactus but the plush stops if its microscopic little spines remain stuck by only the slightest touch in your own flesh. The choya simply releases these hooks and leaves them where they do not belong. The rest of the vegetation is bristling, thorny bushes that more or less cover the ground, depending on altitude and attribute. At sunset in Keys View, the Salton Sea sparkles below us in the distance one last time. It is a glorious feeling to be up here, frightening at the same time, because the bottom of the Andreas Fault runs through here, the fault responsible for massive earthquakes. During the night, the Airstream trailer nestles between large, round, polished monoliths, the jumbo rocks, and Joshua trees. No light from nearby cities. Here and there, a star flashes, and I wish I could see a shooting star fall from heaven or a meteor shower. Coyotes howl that night. Pioneer Town is not a ghost town from the time of the gold and silver rush. A film set has mutated into a city. Sets, however, were more than facades. They were real buildings. Terry Paul was a young hairdresser with a penchant for romantic desert stories who knew the location because of a girlfriend who was a makeup artist. What is remaining here um, when old westerns became uh, passe in the 50s? They unincorporated this area, sold out to the public. And then you had to be able to bring your buildings up to code or they would tear them down. Main Street used to be full of buildings on both sides of the street all the way down. Unfortunately, in the 60s when they tore them down because people couldn't bring them up to code. Some people bought them, made one bedroom homes out of them. Um, over the years, I just was fortunate enough in 1992, I bought the first log cabin and the caretaker's house, and then, then I got to buy more property and more property, which is how I ended up with um, this four acres that I own of part of the old movie set. This entire area is not a place that you live because you're stuck here. Um, this is a place you live because you see the beauty in the Joshua trees and in the dryness, and then the, you have to like the heat. <laughs> Basically, Pioneer Town is ran by all females. We have a female um, postmaster and myself who I'm called the Land Baroness because I've got four, five rentals along this street. The new owners were chilling on Main Street, talking, looking, holding a beer, some wine, a joint. They took certain liberties. They were on private land. This is our private party room where we allow the reenactors to come in and we have a couple of kegs of beer and we just have a good time. Everybody has to be dressed in uh, at least 1860 to 1890 costumes in order to come into the bar and uh, partake in the, in the festivities in here. 
I'd like to introduce you to Gayla. She's been a dear friend of mine. She was donated, her and her husband were donated to our saloon um, about mm, 11 years ago. And uh, unfortunately, some of the cowboys didn't like Jerry around, so Jerry no longer is with us. And Gayla is left and she lives here in the saloon and she's the uh, watcher over and all the cowboys just really enjoy having her around. On weekends, visitors storm in in Pioneer Town, especially with children. They want a breath of Western atmosphere and a look behind the scenes of the former movie set. I lived here for 10 years and uh, finally got tired of having to deal with um, bringing my water up because our water is non-potable. It's got arsenic in it, so you're not supposed to drink it. So we have to cook and eat with our drink bottled water. So. Um, I just got really tired of it. So I moved down to a country club down in Desert Hot Springs. So I've got heated swimming pools and um, nine hole golf course and jacuzzis and natural mineral waters. And I'm as happy as can be down there. <laughs> it's a great place to, this is now a great place to visit. And I do come up at least two times a week. Buying into a piece of history or an adventure is not uncommon in the California desert, where UFOs land or huge rocks split open. Years ago, back in the early 70s, I had the opportunity to go up underneath the rock. And it wasn't split at the time, it was one great big huge rock. But there was a gentleman, he was a German, so the story goes, um, that had built his home underneath the rock. And you actually could walk under the rock and you, he had a living room, he had a bedroom, he had bookshelves, and he had a bed. And everything was, was carved out of the rock. It was very, very fascinating and very interesting. Um, we never got to meet him, although it's kind of a mystery because I don't know whether Van Tassel was actually that German or not. Van Tassel has never admitted that he was the German guy. But when you spoke to him, he did have a German accent, and he was German. So, if, you know, you kind of have to sort of wonder about that one. He believed very strongly in UFOs. And he would sit down and tell you stories for hours and hours about how he went up into the spaceships and all the rides that he'd go on and all the experiments that they did with him. Back in the late 60s, they had a UFO convention out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. There is 25 to 3,000 people, and they're everywhere, literally everywhere, and they're all sitting there, and they're all looking up at the sky, waiting for the UFOs. No UFOs ever came, and they dispersed at the end of the weekend, but it's a sight that you just never forget. The gray-brown split monolith under which the former test pilot and self-proclaimed aeronautical scientist Van Tassel is said to have lived, but who certainly stayed in contact with the UFOs, has fallen prey to vandalism. Graffiti adorns the almost 66-foot high rock, the once mystical site of the spacecraft conventions. In the 70s, the government filled the underground rooms with cement and demolished the private airstrip. Among the highlights in Van Tassel's life was boarding a spaceship from Venus, where he claims he learned how to rejuvenate cells. We stop briefly at the Integraton, the generator he constructed in 1953 intended to influence human cell structure. Many have made a pilgrimage to this wooden cathedral modeled on Moses' holy tabernacle that is located on a geomagnetic vortex to heal ailments. Others come for rejuvenation or meditation. And then there are those who, like its designer, see the human body as a battery and the integraton as a battery charger. There's a big black hole in me in the center, yelling, help, please help, please help. It's day and street in the heart of winter. We're only the wicked one. We're only the She's drowning in it quickly 
the desert, with its cumulative energy from the sun and wind, guarantee the future of humanity? Apart from the giant wind turbines, the energy industry invests primarily in pioneering solar systems. First providers have already gone on the power grid. Science and technology have always been at home in the Mojave. In addition to eccentrics and dropouts, it's also the playground for inventors and visionaries, not to mention the military and Marines in 29 Palms, China Lake, or at the famous Edwards Air Force Base. The legendary Mojave Air and Spaceport is our next goal. Chuck Yeager took off from here to break the sound barrier. Virgin Galactic and x run their space flight tests from this location. But before we look to the future, we pay a visit to the aircraft graveyard. Gutted passenger aircraft and worn out jets have found their final resting place. This is where change is happening. We have a saying around here that we think that this is the best kept secret in the business. We can see the future from here. 20 years ago, nobody could have guessed that a space travel test station would arise from a small desert airport. With her knowledge of fiberglass, Marie Walker landed a three-year contract with NASA. Then came race cars, military, and medical science. She models aircraft noses and repairs huge windmill blades. Young, 22 years old, hey, let's start a company. You know, let's, uh, you have nothing to lose. We had no car payments, no mortgage payments, no kids. Uh, it just made a lot of sense to uh, do something like this. We're rocket fans out here. We like rockets. Everything we do here, we eat, breathe, and sleep. Uh, the f you know, just thinking of the future and space travel, and it, it's just, it's real exciting where, you know, you're not limited in your dreams and your visions, and this is where people come. People come to Mojave Airport to make those dreams come true. For the adventure with Virgin Galactic, six first-class passengers with window seats, each tourist will pay $200,000. x offers a trip as co-pilot in a glass cockpit. This ride costs half as much. Mike Massey, a member of the x team, sees his work as a mission. We are following a path that those government programs have blazed uh, to uh, put people into space more affordably uh, and make it possible for more people to go. Anybody who has an interest in space, uh, anybody who has an interest in science fiction, I would like to give them a, a new perspective on things. From space, you can't see borders of countries, you can't see walls, you can't see fences. You, can, you know, the Earth looks pristine from that altitude. And seeing that and seeing the curvature of the Earth and seeing this beautiful blue marble that's all by itself in the blackness of space, it changes your perspective into realizing that, you know, hey, we're all together in this. It's all one Earth. Space flight's inspiring. What really inspires our customers is, is the opportunity to do what they've seen astronauts do to this day, uh, day and age. They get to ride a rocket into space, which already is a tremendous experience. You're experiencing G-forces on your body that you would never experience in, in your day-to-day -day life. For example, on Spaceship Two, during while the rocket motor is burning, there's about three and a half times the force of gravity you experience on the ground normally forced into your body. A suborbital flight with feathered wing flaps would be the fulfillment of a childhood dream for Enrico Palermo. The young Australian is the director of the spaceship company, a subsidiary of Virgin Galactic. Release, release, release. 
The next pass is really the majesty of space, uh, the blackness of space, the thin electric blue line of the atmosphere on Earth and the zero G, so the ability to feel unencumbered uh, without gravity as you, you float around inside the cabin of the spaceship. And one of the things we often hear from astronauts that have travelled to space is the effect and the appreciation of the fragility and of our environment here on Earth. Both companies have joined forces with tour operators. Both sell tickets. They see the Mojave as a test site, but not as a tourist gateway to the skies. XCOR is thinking about Caribbean vacations that might be spiced up with a space flight. Virgin Galactic has built its own spaceport in New Mexico. I definitely would like to take a ride in a spaceship someday and, and ride on spaceship too, but I just decided I got to thinking, maybe not the first one. I'm a little chicken there, but yes, I would definitely love to, to fly and see the horizon and see the black sky with all the stars, yes. The idea of space hotels and orbiting habitats is not too far away. I would say in the next 10 years, you're gonna see something like that. After that, I would say, you know, settling of planets and things, that will come uh, next. Once we have established waypoints in orbit and between the Earth and the Moon, uh, places where we can uh, refuel, propellant depots, things like that. So there's this whole infrastructure that we kind of need that we haven't, uh, that we haven't built up yet. And uh, if we don't do that as a species, uh, we're probably in pretty big trouble because the next big uh, dinosaur killer asteroid that comes along is gonna be a people killer asteroid. And uh, if we don't have anybody uh, offshore, so to speak, um, colonizing Mars, colonizing the moon, uh, then you know, our chances of surviving as a species are uh, much slimmer. I don't know how I ended up here. It's where I believe the good Lord meant for me to be. Um, but it has a mystique. While people work on their private programs and their secret projects, I don't see too much of the competition. They're all unique and they kind of have a niche of what they're doing. And I'd have to say that that's probably the general feeling and the atmosphere around this amazing place, Mojave Air and Spaceport, in the middle of the Mojave Desert, in the middle of nowhere. We're not close to any big cities or anything. absolutely 100% believe there is a direct connect between God and our space program here at Mojave Air and Spaceport. He puts the inspiration in our heart that gives us that adventurous spirit, that spirit to go and explore things that we can't see. It's the way the human mind works. We always want to know how things work and we always want to push the envelope and we want to go beyond what we can see, hear, feel, touch. Um, Yes, I believe God is the inspiration behind all of this. While Marie, Michael, and Enrico dream walk through the galaxies, Deanna Long describes her encounter with space aliens here in remote, lonely Trana. Around 
around 11.30, I'm walking down this bike path here, and I see a white pickup truck parked next to a bunch of uh, set-up lights surrounding a hole that uh, someone, whether the government or whether a, a local company had been digging. Um, it was very dark out. There was no moon. I, I don't think there was a moon. No, there was no moon. And um, I was almost parallel with the truck. And as I got, as I'll face this direction, and um, I see this white pickup truck and I see something moving very fast in the truck. And I'm like, it looked like a person headbanging or something. And. I was telling myself, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm seeing an alien. I'm sure I was, no, I was not a druggie then. I've, I've tampered with drugs with bad people at times, but now I was, yeah. It was really something I saw. It was no, um, like, hallucination. I kept my eyes on it, and I just started walking backwards, and I was just, like, staring at it, like, and, you know, and it just kept staring at me. And so I got about 30 feet away and I started to create a diversion. So I took off my top shirt. I had two shirts on. I took off my top shirt and started swinging it around and I was yelling, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, because I was very scared. I've seen them on TV. <laughs> I've seen portrayals, people that say they've saw them. They look, okay, it looked like a oval head. It had teardrop eyes. It had two dots for the nose and a skinny little mouth. It had a torso that was just like a human's, but only very skinny, very defined. It had very skinny arms. I saw it from about here up. I saw it from about the stomach waist up. It had a little tiny six pack. It did, like muscles. And um, it was definitely an alien. It was bald and uh, it was staring at me and its head was moving as I was moving. I think it possibly could have been locked in the truck um, by people who may have captured it before. I, that sounds crazy, but there is a base just right over the mountains. There's crazy stuff that goes on out here. I've seen worse than that alien. That's what happened. I, I, I got around this curve over here about a quarter of a mile up and I still just, my heart was still pounding. And there was no other cars on the highway, nothing. It's very dead out here at night because there's not very many people, but literally that's, that's what happened. Uh, saw an alien. Pretty cool. So aliens are real, I think. <laughs> and I do think that there's probably some uh, hidden knowledge of them around this California desert. The stories of secret missions, flying saucers, and staged moon landings refuse to go away. Then a sign abruptly interrupts my thoughts. Futurism meets the past in Trana, and the wind tries in vain to enshroud the small dying town with a cloud of white borax dust. A drive through the gray nothingness, distance and wind, Death Valley looks like a miniature version of the entire Mojave in a smaller space, and almost without any inhabitants. Only 24 people live on 96,875 square yards, Native Americans of the Shoshone Timbisha tribe. The Airstream trailer from the Panamint Valley slowly winds its way up the steep hills into the second huge valley, Death Valley. The lowest point is 282 feet below sea level.
Nothing sings, nothing flies, nothing moves, not even a car. With each step, we go deeper into the sand dunes. We enter an almost eerie silence. From a distance, the Barkhan dunes appear sharp, but if you come closer, you see how the constant movement of the drifting sand blurs the lines. The fine light gray sand has ripple marks. They tell you the direction of the prevailing wind. The bright color of the sand, greatly enlarged, is a mix of gray and brown with green, blue, yellow, and even red. And the sand grains are not made of identical material, nor uniformly sanded, so they are still young. And then something is lying there, like upward curling porcelain shards in the sand. A plant is often right in the middle. They are dried out pools of fresh water. The light and shadow is dramatic, and finally it gets brighter, the tip of a flame in a sea of stones. The rising sun is a must see on Zabriskie Point. The full moon setting an unexpected, rare encore. On the other side, the Badlands, V-shaped gullies caused by erosion in soft sediments, an indication that a lake had once filled this valley. Today, roads run every which way through the National Park. An old hotel in the Furnace Creek Oasis from the time of Borax was restored and converted into a luxury accommodation. Respectful memories of the miners and mine workers are vivid, of people who crossed this deadly country less than 200 years ago, searching for a better life and California gold. We reach Badwater, the lowest and hottest spot in America. The dried out gray white salt bed in Death Valley holds unearthly beauty, octagons, intricate salt crystals, organic looking structures, whose cold white color makes you forget for a moment the furnace you are standing in. White clumps of grass flicker like burning candles. After a long, lonely ride through anthracite-colored landscape, we reach black and white scenery. The intensely dark concrete gray suggests a volcanic origin. When looking into the Ubihibi crater, then again, completely unexpected, there are colors. We leave the dust raised by the mirages and Death Valley behind us. Pahrump, Nevada is our final destination. We meet Ron Wayne, the third founder of Apple, who had a great financial fortune in his hands, but didn't want to keep it. Hello? Yes? 
Yes. Coins? Yes, of course. We'll see you then. Thank you very much. Bye. I was 40 years old at the time, and Mr. Jobs and Mr. Wozniak were in their 20s, and they were whirlwinds. It was like having a tiger by the tail. And uh, trying to keep up with them, uh, and what I suspected they had in mind for me as a participant in the company, I felt that if I had stayed with Apple, I would probably have wound up the richest man in the, in the cemetery. As soon as the Apple Computer Company was formed, and Steve Jobs went out and sold a uh, hundred computers to the Byte Shop, which was a retail outlet, uh, he also went out and borrowed fifteen thousand dollars in order to buy the supplies to fulfill that order. Uh, I also found out that the Byte Shop uh, had a very bad reputation for not paying their bills, and if they had not paid for the computers, uh, the, I, uh, the, co the company would have been on the line for the fifteen thousand dollar loss in which case I, as part of a company, not a corporation, would have been liable for 10% of that, $1,500, and I had no idea where I would get the 1500 Again, while I was absolutely certain that Apple was going to be very successful, but it was also going to be a, a, a roller coaster. These kids, uh, Jobs and Wozniak, were perfectly capable of riding that roller coaster, but I, I didn't feel that I wanted to uh, I'd been on that ride once, and I thought once around was enough. Lack of an appetite for risk after a bankruptcy and the pace of the hungry young partners drove Ron to leave the trio after only 12 days. Didn't he feel that something important was about to happen? And how has he come to terms with the fact that he now lives on welfare, even though he had the chance to become a billionaire several times over? To be absolutely candid, I have never regretted the move. Ron is a pragmatist. His hobby is to deal in stamps and coins. He has dogs. If he lets a stranger in his house, he locks up and gets the gun out. My reason for backing away from this very exciting enterprise had to do largely with whether or not I was psychologically able to handle that kind of very uh, dynamic uh, activity. In addition to which, uh, my interest in what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life was focused on product development uh, in various fields, uh, mostly whimsical fields like slot machines. One-armed bandits still hold him captive. Ron gave up on hitting the jackpot a long time ago. Only a few hours away and still in the middle of the gray desert. Glitter, neon, and high rises. Las Vegas, the artificial megacity in the Mojave Desert, reminds us that we are in America, the land of dreams and illusions and not yet on other, more distant planets. The desert of Jordan is a jewel among deserts, rocky and rugged, but made up of a fine, delicate pink sand. Vadi Rum is celebrated and made famous in films like Lawrence of Arabia. Petra means stone, but I don't think my interest in rocks and microstones came with my given name. I discovered my love for sand, rocks, structures, and surfaces while traveling in nature.
The Jordanian desert tour begins in Wadi Musa, the biblical site where Moses is said to have smote a rock and caused abundant water to come out on the way to the promised land. A rapidly growing town, which is controlled by a few Bedouin families. Wadi Musa is nestled on a mountaintop, and from there you can see the city called Petra. A milky morning light falls on the mountains that hide Petra. A spectacular view of the extent of the ancient city, 400 square miles in a pale honey color. Only a quarter of Petra is thought to have been excavated. On the back of a horse, in a carriage or on foot, one manages to pass through the narrow gorge, the Sikh, in the center of the ancient site. I choose a white horse. Petra is one of the seven wonders of the world, as well as a mystery. The pink city of the Nabataeans poses more questions than we can answer. The Nabataeans traded and collected customs duties. They opposed slavery and allowed their women to have property. It's not known whether the camel carved in stone, being led by a human hand, proves that Petra was on a caravan route. The folds in the luxurious robe seem to indicate the answer is no. Many other rock formations are subject to the interpretation of the viewer. The elephant fish rock is a prominent example. The Nabataeans developed an ingenious irrigation system that secured their lives and their affluence. Even today, in many parts of the Sikh, gutters, pipes, and reservoirs may be recognized. Its geographical location made the city impregnable, but the Romans devised a clever plan of conquest. They cut off the water supply. With the fall of the Roman Empire, Petra went into decline. A narrow beam of light at the end of a dark, increasingly narrow path announces Petra. A small bend, and then I am standing in front of the famous treasury, the most magnificent of all the buildings, and the subject of many postcards and calendars. But was it really a treasure chamber? Why would the Nabataeans display all their most precious belongings in plain sight at the entrance of the city? A young Bedouin from Badi Musa, Mamun al Nabafle, has a completely different theory. This is a given name by the locals who uh, lived here at the 18th and the 19th, or the 19th century, believing that uh, the uh, uh, urn at the top of it uh, contained uh, gold, a treasure. So they were shooting it in order to bring this gold out. And from that time, uh, it got this name, treasure. I hope it would be named the conference room or the meeting room, and plus the calendar and the astronomical map, because it contains all of them. Surprising how unadorned the high interior is when compared to the artistically chiseled facade. The Nabataeans have left little behind that explains this city carved in granite and sandstone. Or is it more we know? Mamun has found abundant evidence everywhere for his theory that Petra was a science center. Has the city been misread? Interpretations are always linked to the experiences of the historian. Mamun has deciphered the facade of the treasure trove as an almanac. Starting from the uh, top, 
the crown below has 12 curves that represents the uh, uh, 12 months of the year. The columns are 12 uh, and that represents 12 months a year. Above the first layer of the uh, columns, we find seven cups. That's for seven days a week. Uh, talking about numbers, talking about uh, the uh, uh, constellations, everything there looks like uh, a result of many years of work on astronomy, timekeeping, uh, environment, weather forecasting, uh, etc. So uh, it represents their whole life. To his mind, a basin previously thought to be a sacrificial bowl does not contain any reference to a religious site. Instead, he sees the characteristics of a water clock. This is a water clock. Uh, they used to fill with water, and uh, it's in order to know how much time the meetings uh, took when they used to meet in this room. And besides that, we found the blades that would fit the same uh, size and that's not to major. The channel is very tiny uh, to be uh, uh, a channel for blood. It's too tiny. Uh, it can only be for water. You know, blood goes thick uh, immediately after uh, uh, shitting it. So it's impossible. It's, uh, it's a place for water. This is for water. Mamun takes us high up to the place of sacrifice on the mountain. He has redefined it in terms of astronomy, cartography, and the measurement of time. Two obelisks jut out, the pointers of a sundial. Down there we have uh, the marking board on which they used to mark the passage of days. They used the V shape as a code or a signal for time. Uh, this is part of the uh, uh, almanac. Um, it is now called uh, the high place of sacrifice, believing that they used to sacrifice uh, whether animals, babies or whatever. In Mamun's eyes, Petra has been misinterpreted, and he will prove it, knowing that in addition to his theory, 26 other competing theories are out there. He first presented his research to the king, then in 2008 to the general public at a symposium in Rome. Under the auspices of Abdullah II, he finally put together a team to find further evidence. <laughs> I felt trapped between Petra and this room for 10 years. At dawn, before sunrise, I went to Petra. I watched developments very closely. I followed the light and shadow. I was looking for facts and their meaning, and gradually learned to read the signs. My mother, God bless her, has always been at my side. She woke me up at an early hour, fixed breakfast and coffee, and gave me something to eat when I was away, because she knew I would have a long day. This helped me and encouraged me. She sensed that I had a self-imposed duty to fulfill and a message. Other people thought I was crazy, but they didn't know what I was crazy about. I was crazy about Petra. Petra was the secret of my life, and I found amazing things. I have also suffered much, but Petra was worth it. Once a local Bedouin kid with no formal education 
who has become an influential figure in Jordan, I owe Mamoun my thanks for being able to take part in a Friday prayer. As the first Western woman, I was not only allowed to be here, but also to film in the mosque. Strictly separated by gender, the faithful come together for prayer. Immediately afterwards, the men use the gathering to talk about politics and business, or even agree to take upcoming meetings. Outside of Petra, on a spectacular plain in front of a cave, Suleiman Oatman and his family have pitched their brown Bedouin tent. They use the neighboring mountain as a room with a view. I was always here. We don't leave our place to live somewhere else. There just isn't a better place than this. This is where I feel at ease. We love our house of hair and don't want to live in a settlement. We are nomads. We love this country and we love Wadi Araba, the mountains, just about everything here. When I come home from work, I look after my sheep. After all, they have to be fed. With small animals, chickens, and a meager vegetable garden, the family provides for itself. Suleiman earns money in Petra for the few things he needs to buy, such as flour, detergent, and most important, water. He offers tourists ancient coins in the sea. He doesn't have a license, nor a car. Suleiman has to walk, an hour there in the morning and nearly two hours back in the evening on the hot, sun-baked roads and rocks. When I walk this far every day, it makes me stronger and stronger. It's possible that my sons love the city and love the electricity. But as for me, I don't like the city or the electricity. I prefer the desert. I hope my children will be the same one day. I wish that they'll love the desert just like me.
Barakat al Amarat is in a quarry. Time to make new sand. Make sand? So far for me, sand was something that nature created. I had already seen the little souvenir bottles in his store. Sunsets, camels in the landscape, a starry sky. But I thought he had found the sand he'd used. Barakat tells me that the natural sand he uses for his work is often too coarse-grained and not diverse enough sand colors. He pounds the soft stone until it turns into finely powdered sugar. White and pink sand he can find in Petra. It is fine enough. Greatly magnified, the self-made thing looks different. No ground up grains, but instead a shattered structure. And you realize something else, how colored sand exposes itself. We call it sand bottle art. I learned it from my father about 16 years ago. I watched him make the sand bottles, and that's how I got into it. This art has existed for a long time, for a very long time, since 1920. First of all, the colors of Petra inspired us to use them for this art, the colors of the original stone. These colored rocks were, after all, always in Petra. With his skills, the sand artist unintentionally shows us that sand is more than just solid. It definitely flows. I love my job. Every day, I invent something new. But unfortunately, it's not enough for a living. Because of the situation in the Middle East, there aren't enough tourists to buy the bottles. A road that seems to have been poured into the countryside takes us to Little Petra, the second historic site. Bedouins lived in these caves until a few years ago, and secretly, a lot still do. Despite all attempts by the government at resettlement, they love their caves. Some look for alternative ones in the mountains of the desert. Others, like the previously visited coin cellar, pitch a tent in front of the forbidden caves, which then officially becomes the dwelling. Awad Salam Amarain is wild and rebellious. There are people like me who don't want to live in a house. I can't. I'm there two hours and then something pulls me into the mountains and I'll sit in front of a fire. I can't help it. It's how it is. It's in my blood, in my genes. His posture reminds me of a bird about to take flight. A flight to freedom? He laughs with his dark eyes, bordered by black coal. I must live in a cave. I must buy sheep, because my father bought sheep before me, and camels. Should I buy a little car now? Or a villa with solar panels on the roof? I can't. It's not me.
My grandfather didn't own a house, and he slaughtered and served up food for everyone who came to visit. God bless him. But if you don't have a house now, they don't take you seriously. Then they make the Bedouin a homeless person. They say you have to build a house, and I say no, I want a tent. And if the government says you can't live in a tent, then without a doubt, I'm going to live in a tent. And when they say you can't live in a cave, then I'm going to live in a cave. Then let them arrest me, really. Tradition and modernity mingle in this family. Although he energetically supported his happily unruly siblings, Awad prefers to follow the Bedouin way of life. Secretly, he is setting up a cave for himself and his Western girlfriend. He earns his money as an unofficial tour guide. His mother sells souvenirs. His brother paints with sand. Another brother is visiting. He lives and studies in Paris. His parents moved into a modern stone house in the 70s, to Beta, the village the government built for the Bedouin Amarain. All 12 children in the family were born there. I meet his sister, FF, the first girl from this hamlet to graduate from university. The way was difficult since Beta only has an elementary school. For girls, the irrevocable end of their education, until FF. She is convinced she has set an example other girls will follow. At the beginning of my studies, my family offered no support. But when they saw I was determined and got good grades, they supported me, but not financially. My parents are not well off. To be honest, my motivation is driving me. Even as a very young girl, I was extremely ambitious, and this has never let up. FF walked six miles to school every day. There was no bus. During her studies, she lived on campus. She saves to pay for her master's degree. Of course I don't stop with the masters. I would be very happy about it. But my dream is, God willing, to obtain a PhD. If God allows it, and I believe it will happen, one day I will be minister of tourism. If I tell my parents or my friends, they laugh. But I know full well that the day will come when I can realize my dream. In the end, everything is in God's hands. Although FF has completed a bachelor's degree in archaeology, she can't find work in her profession in Petra. She's a woman. FF bridges the gap with her second career, nursing, which she has already used to finance her studies. The women here in the village needed a woman who would help them. There are so many questions they dare not ask a male doctor or male nurse. There are, for example, women who use birth control, but keep the fact that they are using family planning secret from other women. Or they have problems with their family or their husband they don't want to spread around. I handle my cases confidentially. No one knows about it except her and me. Not even the organization that funds and evaluates us. It's a secret. We make sure that it stays in this room. I was shocked when they suddenly started to cry and talk about their family problems. Of course, I take everything very seriously and give her moral support. She leaves here with a new outlook. I see the change. A new person who before had been desperate, now she is someone else. 
Some women feel like a maid at home. They have no rights. They only have a right to work, nothing else. From Vadi Musa to Vadi Ram, we cross the 35, one of the roads named the 20 most beautiful highways in the world, a landscape with a genteel pallor. Again and again, the dark goat hair tents of the Bedouin magically hold my attention. They occasionally stretch into the landscape, and their Arabic name, House of Hair, which I had heard in Petra for the first time, lingers. Wadi Rum became a national park in 1998 and made the World Cultural Heritage List in 2011. The sunset in front of the gates is like a tribute to the beauty of nature. Yasa Zalave is waiting for me in Vadi Ram. Tourism in the Valley of the Moon is controlled by his tribe, the Zalabea. Welcome. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> for me, that means change. The little red Jeep has to make way for the pickup of my new guide and driver. Okay. Thank you. Rum, the only village in the national park, has a clinic, small shops that offer, in addition to canned food, biscuits and tired looking vegetables, along with household goods, a mobile phone shop, an abandoned cafe, and a gas station. Not a place to linger. One small shop off the main road, however, arouses my interest. It looks like the boy inside, Yasin, is going to play shopkeeper the childlike sales clerk with the large teeth and hands he hasn't grown into yet attracts its own clientele, children. My family lives in the desert. Sometimes they come here to check the shop, then they go back to the desert. I'm 15 years old, and I'm proud that I work. Life in the desert has taught us to be men.
I want to know what's going on with the pink walls that make the place seem so hermetically sealed off. In Yasa's eyes, the walls give freedom to the women who can move at ease behind them and not have to expose themselves to the gaze of the tourist. My eyes gaze at the only woman who shows herself in public, then darts to a barred window with flowers and hearts. Sixty-two miles long, 37 miles wide, an active, growing fissure that has sometimes created lakes, once let the Red Sea rush in or simply remain just a rocky gorge. Red sand dunes lie along the way, camels pass by, some rock formations and stone bridges jut out from the fine red desert sand. A camel looks at me and then rolls around in the sand. Yasa said that is his form of purification. The camel is taking his shower. He initiated me into another mystery of the camel, explaining the difference between camel feet and horse hooves. <laughs> We Bedouin use camels rather than horses for transportation. There are many reasons. First, the camel uses little water while traveling. It is enough if it only gets water every three to four days. Second, the foot of the camel, in Arabic, hof, has a larger surface area than the hoof of a horse. When I put my hand flat on the ground and push, it stays on the surface. But if I do this, it sinks in the sand. That makes it hard for the horse to walk in the sand. It gets tired and, most of all, slower. The camel is also called the desert ship. There are two reasons. The first reason is that the foot of the camel always stays on the surface of the sand like a ship. When it moves, it always stays on the surface of the sea. Secondly, the camel moves by bringing the right hand forward together with the right foot and moves the left hand along with the left foot. So it's similar to rowing, right, left, right, left. Sometimes the men gather the bleached bones and bring them home. Their wives hone and polish them and bead them. Then they give the necklaces to the men to take with them outside. Women are not allowed to offer the merchandise themselves. While I am still considering the jewelry, Yasa begins to burn sage, in our culture an almost forgotten form of purification.
As the son of a sheikh, Yasser had the opportunity to study tourism in Amman. He is a licensed tour guide. His dream is to open an internet cafe in his village of Ram. The internet cafe is of less interest to me than the fact that he is the son of a sheikh, which makes me curious. I associate the word sheikh with the tales of a thousand and one nights and the past. Would his father be willing to grant me an audience? The story of the Bedouin had two phases, the phase of lawlessness in the past and the phase in which the laws and constitutions have to be respected and are now valid for the Arab leadership. The most important thing to the sheikh in the era of lawlessness was that he had strong warriors and that his tribe had many members. Independence forced him to defend what was his, his person, his underlings, his property and his territories. At the time of the law, the sheikh has to have many qualities of insight, experience, knowledge and diplomacy. And he must be able to communicate, to be able to negotiate with all forms of authority, whether official or unofficial. Yasser is proud to be the eldest son of the sheikh and to inherit the duties of the sheikh. Since childhood, he has been allowed to accompany and observe the father. His social network is in place. I am filled with pride for my father because he is not just a sheikh, he is human, a real man in all areas, and I see that everyone respects him. Do you think I'm ready? The way you raised me and brought me up to be the future sheikh, in your opinion, am I prepared to deal with the future? In truth, I am myself sure that my son is ready and that all my sons will support him and be there for him. For me, it does beg the question of whether today an eldest daughter can be sheikh. A woman can never be a sheikh. Her body can't bear such burdens. During pregnancy, she is vulnerable, even more so at birth when they have children. It has phases, biological or physical, in which she is exempt from prayer. A man can always pray. A man may also lead the prayer, be an imam but not a woman. According to the principles of our belief, all the evidence proves that women and men differ in their physical constitution. I ask the son, the enlightened, educated Bedouin, Yasser. My father is the main source for the transmission of knowledge, tradition, experience and skills I've gained in my life. So my answer would be the same as his. The Valley of the Moon, as Vadi Rum is also called, is a stone amphitheater in front of a pale grayish sky, an earthly terrain that the astronauts thought closely resembles the moon's surface so it frequently serves as a film set. The ripples the wind leaves in the sand indicate the prevailing wind direction and how protected or unprotected the location in question is. The red sand is finer here than anywhere else. The wind chases it around. Or does the sand play and dance in the wind? Saltation is the name given to the jumping grains of sand and the smaller the grain of sand, the more traveling it does. From a distance, the clip looks as if it were stamped or printed, yet on closer examination, drip marks are visible. My geologist advisor said I was right, the cliff drips. The rain that always contains some acid dissolves silt and cement and transforms it into a mushy, dripping mud. The water evaporates. What remains are the beautiful structures.
Also new for me is that the watering holes where the caravans once stopped to water their animals and to put water in their containers are hidden in caves filled with hanging gardens. The fine powdered sand is full of pitfalls and shallows, even for experienced drivers. Bedouin camps spring up from the ground. They are set up for tourists. The Bedouins in Badi Rum are no longer nomadic. Only a few live from sheep and goats. And even they don't stay outdoors for more than a few days at a time. The majority of Jordanian Bedouin are now sedentary and live from tourism. So here's your tent where you'll stay the night. An etagere with meat and vegetables. I wonder if this Bedouin way to cook inspired our energy saving hay box cooker. Their reflecting hide and body temperature rising up to 115 degrees make it possible for the oryx to tolerate the scorching sun of the desert. Only six of them were alive when Saudi Arabia and Jordan banded together in 2007 to save the overhunted Arab antelope, an arduous breeding program, and the establishment of reserves have kept the oryx from extinction but it will take years until the animals can be released back into the wild.
I travel further to Aqaba with the old Hedjoss Railway. Today, I'm riding alone, but tomorrow, the old steam locomotive, whose tracks are currently being used solely for phosphate transport, will be transporting tourists again. The Hedjoss Railway, once part of the Baghdad Railway and the Orient Express, was a short-lived dream. Soldiers and forced laborers built the railroad, technically a pioneering achievement. Neither heat, nor drought, nor sandstorms were able to stop the ambitious project. But wars and lack of fuel kept bringing the railway to a standstill. The legendary steam locomotive fueled by oil since 1942, has brought me through the Pink Desert to the Red Sea. Our journey is over. I was hoping to see water, but disappointed that it is not pink. but I was quickly reconciled with Aqaba and its nostalgic charm. Once a vibrant harbor, it seems abandoned. No steam, no sail. From above, I have a look at the city of Aqaba, then across the border strip to Elat. Here in this small outlet of the Red Sea, four countries meet which are as closely related as they seem yet could not be more different. Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. The Salar de Uyuni in Bolivia is a white desert. It is neither sand nor gravel nor stone. It is made of salt. An unusual desert, unique in the world, in which heaven and earth coalesce and fuse in a fantastic way. White, this is not a color in the usual sense, but the sum of all colors. Before I can delve further into this idea, something unexpected happens. In the evening sky, a last beam of white light splits into colored lights and is enshrouded in a cloud, a beautiful metaphor. On our arrival in Uyuni, we have come to the Southern Hemisphere. It is winter. The temperatures drop to 10 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Waiting for my driver gives me a first intimation of the calm, the slowness, and loneliness that will accompany us here in the high Andes.
procession on Good Friday, colorful and dramatic, with a Snow White's glass coffin, penitential robes, and the tormented body of Jesus on the cross. It reminds us of the former colonial power. The Spaniards brought the Catholic faith with them. To me, even some 500 years later, the faces of the Aymara and Quechua don't match up with this European religion. La piadosa Verónica, movida por la compasión, enjuga el rostro de Jesús, recibiendo como recompensa la impresión del bello rostro de Jesús en el pan aliviador. The procession of intense prayer takes five hours, and it brings movement and color to the otherwise bleak, gray, desolate town. The Easter ceremonies have not yet concluded. The next morning, the faithful climb up Calvary, which is located outside the small town, and symbolically take Jesus down from the cross. Once more, they must stop and kneel at each white post and pray. It is both a religious and a social event. I will forego the pilgrimage tour and let Lucian read the coca leaves to know about our journey. A journey then, and I need to ask the coca leaves. It's an ancient plant, a fortune teller for all of us who believe, for all of us who worship the priests, the Holy Spirit of God. So we use the coca. It doesn't embody anything bad for us. It's a miracle plant. Coca sustains our life force, accelerates our work, and stills our hunger. The little coca talks to you, and if she's sweet, then you'll be fine. When a deal is closed, for example, we chew a little. If it tastes sweet, you'll be fine. But if it's bitter, then that's a bad sign. Then you should stay away from it. Petra, Divine Holy, the trip to Mama Tinupa, the Salt Lake in Kawasi. Happiness is her constant companion. Set out from Uyuni. Other countries, continents, you will run into difficulties, but everything will end well. With this favorable prophecy and a trail of dust, only 5% of all the roads in Bolivia are paved. We leave for Colchani, the center of salt mining and the gateway to the Salah.
At night, we see cars on mud roads right and left that don't have any license plates. We are told that these mostly white cars are being smuggled into the country across the salt Just desert. Drugs, especially the white snow, cocaine, is extracted from the coca leaf and is driven out the same way, often by unsuspecting tourists. Just for you. And I will lie awake a little more. Just for you. I will starve myself. A little more Just for you I will lose myself A little more A local police officer, Walter Uyuli, won't confirm the smuggling going on in the Salar and along the Chilean-Bolivian border. We don't have any complaints or incidents. If we had complaints, any report of stolen vehicles, then we would act immediately and be ready to answer questions at the appropriate department, no? But since we don't have any evidence of stolen vehicles or the like, we don't do anything. As a child, you dream about making something of your life. This was the dream that led me to become a policeman. Here is where a checkpoint was set up for tourists. They come to see the Salar de Uni. Only the guides who drive them are not always very responsible. And it was at the request of the village, because in the past the driver simply drove every which way here. Today they must register at the checkpoint. The driver and the vehicles that drive back and forth are registered, and this way the tourists have added security. Sometimes during the rainy season, you can't see the trails or the tire tracks in the salt desert. So if we notice that someone is not signed out, we find him in the list. And if the vehicle is actually not returned, we report that there is a problem right away. We then contact the authorities in Uyuni and request the largest police contingent that is available. Colchani is not attractive. 150 people, twice as many dogs, and just as many pigs are said to live here. A few muddy salt and adobe huts, mounds of salt, shops for the essentials and souvenir stalls for meaningless mementos. No one would ever make the arduous journey here were there not the Salar a more than 3,800 square mile expanse of salt flats, now in April, at the end of the rainy season, still covered with a shallow level of water, it is a gigantic natural mirror that doesn't simply show the unusual colors and textures, but even reflects them. Colchani has a bed and breakfast, 
But despite an increasing number of backpackers, adventure tourists, and cultural travelers on the well-worn path to Inca culture, it is not yet an actual tourist destination. The small, unheated accommodation is made of salt. There is abundant salt, and salt stores heat in this inhospitable climate of down to four degrees Fahrenheit. Not only the exterior walls, even the tables, chairs, and beds are made of stacked salt blocks. Even the new, seemingly oversized hotels, which rely and wait on the completion of the Uyuni shuttle airport for the anticipated mass tourism, continue this tradition. Inside the Luna Salada, even the floor is made of loose, granular, crunchy salt. For those who eke out a meager existence here, the countryside holds little charm. The caustic salt dries out the skin and eyes and causes the people to age quickly. It is difficult to watch women struggle with the wet, heavy salt. Feliciano Cruz has been shoveling salt for 50 years. He wonders why he still works the way his ancestors did. Why doesn't his cooperative acquire some technical help? A power shovel, for example. He's heard they exist. Because of the extreme reflection of the salt, he ties a scarf around his face or pulls on an old worn ski mask. Still, his skin is dry and tan. The dark sunglasses will only help to delay the day when the harsh light from the desert floor robs him of his sight. Feliciano earns 70 Bolivianos, $10 a day. From his earnings as an independent contractor, he can send his children to school. That makes him feel proud. White and the blue of the reflecting sky are the only colors here. And the unseeable horizon and the lack of depth perception cause objects to appear as toys or optical illusions. The white desert, a surreal drama, decorated with fluffy clouds, an evening breeze, art meets the ordinary, the everyday. We don't believe our eyes. Is it a bizarre reality or a dream? But aren't the moments in a dream ultimately within the realm of possibilities? The rattling freight train startles me out of my reverie and yanks me back to the bitter, cold reality.
Child labor, so we were told, does not exist in Bolivia. The children only help their parents. 14 and 15 year old boys temporarily store the bags of salt in the depot of the train station. At some unknown time of night, a freight train will make a stop and haul them away. I want to know how they imagine their future. Here in Bolivia, after we graduate, we have to do our military service. You can only go to the university after that. Like him, I also have to go to the military, but then to college. I want to do something with my life, have a good profession. Nobody in my family was ever a doctor. I want to be the first. I like the idea of healing people because I don't want to work hard all my life here in the Salt Lake. The work is too brutal. So when I've got my high school diploma, I'll go away from here to another city. I'm going somewhere else to start a family, because if I come back here, I'll only end up in the salt again. It's better to forget this place. For our film permit, we need to dig deep into the bag of coca leaves. Why? I would like to know from Etsun, are you hiding under that really strange ski mask? Well, to protect myself from the sun, because the face when I'm working without a mask gets ugly. I get all black. And to avoid this damage to the skin, I use it. If you don't, you'll burn your skin. And I don't want that. Because you're a sissy? No. Come on, show us your face. Here's my face. You're really pretty. <laughs> While our boys load salt into plastic bags, Others shovel the sodium salt, designated for agriculture and livestock, directly on the flatbed of the transport. I wonder how they can eat ice cream at these temperatures. But for children, it is a reward, a delicacy, one of the few they have here. And Herman Kolka from Uyuni sees it this way too. He has been making ice cream night after night in his tiny backyard factory with no running water for 20 years.
Everybody loves ice cream. Here in Uyuni, it is always cold, at least in June, July. This is our winter time. Then it is colder, but people eat the same amount of ice cream, at least at folk festivals, no? And the alcohol drinkers are thirsty the next day, so we go around and the people buy. I was a street vendor and sold for others, because back then I didn't have any machines and had to seek work with someone who had an ice cream factory. These people, or the owner, paid me 30% of what I sold. In this way, I began to figure out how to make ice cream and to discover the exact recipe so I could make it alone. That's how I got started. I didn't know anything at the beginning, and I bought the machines on credit and with the help of loans from friends. If he goes to sell on the street and sees the children's eyes light up, Germán feels rewarded. He is proud of his entrepreneurial instinct. It is not a dirty job, but quite the opposite, because there are many who work as a mechanic with work clothes that are very dirty, smeared with oil and grease. This is a much cleaner job. It is a healthier work, too, and not anything to be ashamed of, quite the opposite. It is a profession to be an ice cream man, like any other profession. Ice cream is made the night before because it's hot during the day. With the sun, the machine heats up. That's why you always make ice cream at night or when the sun goes down. I am very pleased and happy that I can provide for my family with this work. I have six children and they are all in school. Endless white on a lunar landscape. Always dealing with other structures, patterns, and risks, you may get lost or fall into the ojos, the eyes. Cars supposedly have been lost in this highly concentrated brine. Miniature salt fairies accompany us, dancing like snowflakes around the car. We pass enormous white plates or crystallized flying saucers in a science fiction world. Finally, we marvel at primordial animals like cave paintings, painted not by hand, but by nature. With our luggage, the propane gas stove, and fuel for the entire journey on the roof, 
we glide through this fantasy countryside that is both attractive and inhospitable at the same time. And then another one of those surreal sunsets. The sun holds us captive until it sets and endangers our drive to Tahua. As the water becomes deeper and more unpredictable the closer we get to shore, the only way to cross is by means of a narrow salt jetty. There is no light. The driver complains about our carelessness, but he makes it. The next morning, we are rewarded with a view, a look back towards the Salar. Rocks from the volcanoes have created this habitat, not just for humans. In winter, colonies of flamingo gather here. Among the most common livestock and pack animals still in the area are the llamas and alpacas. They help the Incas to cross the impassable regions. Their breeding has increased after it became known that their meat is far healthier than that of sheep. How did this white desert develop? Eddie Ramos tells her sons the legend of the Tunupa. We listen enthralled. The Tunupa era una mujer que tenía un hijo que es bonita, ¿no? Y entonces para Cusaña. The volcano Tunupa was a woman who had a son with Kasuna. You see him here at the front. When she left, she had to leave the child with Father Kasuna. But because she could not breastfeed, her breasts filled with milk and swelled up. Tanupa dug a hole in the earth, squeezed her breast, and the milk flowed into it. Then she snacked on some coca, and she created a place where they could spit out the coca balls that were sucked dry. Then she went and met two boys, the hills Chalima and Cora Cora. Both hills fell in love with Tanupa, who was very beautiful. In the dispute over Tanupa, Chalima gave Cora Cora such a violent kick that his stomach burst, and Cora Cora fought back and knocked out Chalima's teeth. You can see the knocked out teeth here. Now Tanupa's breast filled with milk again, and she wept for her son, and that is how there is the Salar de Tanupa. It is the salty milk, which today we call the Salar of Tanupa. The sober geological explanation? It reduces everything to a question of minerals, climate change, and time. If a sea or lake dries out due to reduced rainfall and warming, the pure water becomes mist. Minerals remain and slowly dissolve, depending on their composition. Their structures form a dense white surface, which on closer examination, however, exposes a microcosm of breathtaking works of art, whose color range goes from snow white to transparent, glassy, silky, to grayish dirty, where the name sal, or salt, stems from. The most common salt, sodium chloride, we know as table salt. 
the much rarer lithium chloride for the batteries used in electric vehicles, for example, could play an important role in Bolivia's future. The world's largest reserves are stored deep beneath the salt crust. Only the soft white alloy is difficult to extract. It oxidizes when exposed to air or comes in contact with water. Viewing this magic world is like bathing in a dream. When you awaken, everything disappears. We leave Tahua on the dusty dirt road that goes to Herrera. Our driver doesn't want to drive back in the water, but it's not the lack of tracks that he's afraid of. He's worried about his car, the motor, and tires. Not even our guardian angel can protect us from the salt. Other drivers we see are more daring. Because in the beginning it was a lake, there are no towns in the Salar. The government put an abrupt stop to an attempt to operate a hotel there due to waste management issues. The small towns are exclusively shoreline settlements and must frequently make way because the salt continues to make deposits. Again, we encounter an archaic life. And once again, it is mainly the women who do the hardest work. Shoveling rocks and dust, field work, housework, and then still giving birth year after year. A lot of work, much work here in Bolivia. I want you to take me with you to your country. There I could relax and live happy, and on top of that, be well fed. Doña Lupa is joking with us. She would never leave her native country, especially not after she has managed to work her way out of poverty. The truth is that we probably were the poorest in the village. We had to pay for the children and often had nothing to eat. We both started to work in the hope that we would someday get out of our misery. While others who once went to Chile to make money now have to struggle to regain land confiscated while they were away, Doña Lupe and Carlos Munoz benefit from the fact that they have sat out the lean years in their own country. The quinoa has brought us financially forward. The education of our children, our food, clothes, everything. We have to thank this crop for everything. Yes, everything. That is why we call quinoa mother. For us, that's what she is. We worship it as if it were father and mother at the same time. It gives us everything we need. When I walk into my yard and see my quinoa, I embrace and kiss her because she brings me money, the quinoa. The quinoa grain is very beautiful. Quinoa soup tastes good and has a high nutritional value. You can make soup, bread, cereal cakes, pies, cookies, pastries, and even a soft drink from quinoa. 
Yes, look at you. This is how you are if you eat a lot of quinoa. When I was little, I ate only quinoa, which is why I am so strong. Neighbors look enviously at the successful couple. They believe that the burgeoning tourism has brought yeah. prosperity. But the practical Lupe thinks the price increase of the popular protein-rich Andean quinoa on the world market is much more important. The small hotel on which she has been counting for years should be the future, especially for the children. A fascinating woman, 64 years old, unpretentious, and street smart. She navigates the ship called family. Uh. <laughs> Grandmother, mother, wife, companion, and smart business person. Not a hint about running away, nor about whining and complaining. I'm happy because I live here in this country on the banks of the Salt Lake, at the foot of the legendary volcano Tanupa. I'm proud of it. She is also proud of herself. She was open to new ideas as the first visitors pitched their tents. Then the tour guide said, Doña Lupe, get a few accommodations ready, make rooms, and buy cots. You'll make a profit. We'll pay you. The cots, well, I had to buy them. They were made of wood and the sheets of burlap. They used to put flour in the burlap sacks, and I made sheets from them. For pillows, I used my wool blankets. Unlike today, Back then, we didn't have a penny. They paid me for each cot, for every person who slept here. They paid me five bolivianos. We still need to bring sleeping bags, water bottles, and a propane gas stove if we want to spend the night in Herrera. But one of Lupe's daughters, who learned gastronomy, will soon serve her guests delicious lasagna made from quinoa. What does the tourism-oriented Lupe think about the planned lithium mining in the Uyuni? Sure, it's good that they mine it. But if you think about it, then it's not so good. The Salt Lake is so beautiful, and they will destroy it. They begin to mine far away in the south, but it will run rampant. For me, this is bad. If they come here into the nature reserve to mine lithium, we will not let that happen. We will fight this thing. Lupe's existence still doesn't seem to be at risk, rather the historic opportunity for Bolivia's wealth. The country that is among the poorest of the world can't retrieve the treasure. There is a lack of resources and infrastructure. One single national pilot project has been working since 2010 near a copper mining area in the south of the Salar but it still serves more as a study of the mining rather than the lucrative extraction of the mineral. Since their discovery in the 60s, the lithium resources have been a source of controversy, but the fear of being exploited, as in the colonial period, has only paralyzed the country. Tomorrow morning, we will leave Lupe and her family and then dive into the countryside she hopes to conserve for the future.
Basalt Desert, a landscape you can lose or find yourself in. A blank sheet of white paper. We write what we see on it and what we try to understand. Is the nothingness so mysterious because you can project anything on it? Just for you And I will cry myself A little more Just for the high point of our journey through the White Desert came when we reached Isa Inkawasi. The island situated in the middle of the Salt Sea with its giant cactus is a mystical, almost supernatural place that has left a lasting impression on even eminent contemporaries. Alfredo Lazzaro Ticona remembers. Well, see, uh, the first astronaut who flew to the moon came here. From the moon, he saw a mirror that was in the South American continent, but he didn't know in which country. Much later, in 1995, the astronaut came here. I don't remember too well. His name was Armstrong. Armstrong, I, I don't know anymore. But in any case, the astronaut came to find the mirror. The significance of the white is peace, tranquility. Let's say love for all people. That's what it means. When the white flag flies, it means peace, tranquility. And in the Salt Lake, it's no different. Peace, tranquility, there are no problems in the Salt Lake, no conflicts. That is the importance it has for us. There is just nothing here, and you are happy with just white. White is also the salt that we throw in the pan. Who doesn't eat salt? Man can't live without salt. Look what I have, the armadillo. <laughs> In 1987, Alfredo and a friend went to the then uninhabited islands of coral and rock. Because he lived on Inkawazi when it was still undeveloped, he sees himself as lord of the island. For lunch, there were cactus fruit and homegrown potatoes. For sleeping, they crawled into a cave. Most difficult of all was that there is no drinkable groundwater in this oasis. At that time, nobody wanted to live on the islands. People were very afraid. In Bolivia, one is superstitious. They thought the devil, Halmo, would eat them. We have learned to appreciate the salt desert. I don't think there is such a salt lake on any other continent. We began to love it. The Uyuni is an extraordinary treasure for the world. We have sworn with a handshake that we will never leave the Salar again. Not one second, in spite of poverty, hunger, loneliness, and silence. The main thing is not to leave the lake. The friend gave up. Aurelia moved in. We are the personnel who protect the island. We protect the environment, take care of the garbage, the cacti, wildlife, and enforce the rules for visiting the islands. We don't allow tourists to walk around everywhere. You must abide by the rules of the house on the island. In the peak tourist season, up to 100 day trippers swarm to the island. Since the two of them have no other income and travelers love souvenirs, Aurelia has started to knit socks and Alfredo carves miniature works of art made of cactus wood. Up here is my territory. When the tourists storm the island, I retreat back here. My old cave is my refuge. Nobody bothers me here. Desert regions such as the Uyuni are increasingly becoming favorite destinations for globetrotters and world explorers. For the people who live there, it creates jobs and brings in money. Nevertheless, two hearts beat in Alfredo's chest. He fears the destruction of his paradise and tries through education to find the right balance. 
but the Bolivian government already announced in 2011 that more islands will soon open for tourism. The self-proclaimed environmentalists sometimes get in the way. There have been many attempts to get rid of me, but I refused. Today, they respect me. I have many supporters among the tour guides. They say, he is the first inhabitant, and he deserves every respect. Alfredo will faithfully keep his vow. After long years of privation, he persevered without any support. Now he has a right of abode for life, in a real house. Today, paid staff from the province operates during the winter months a restaurant, sell handmade souvenirs, bring fresh water to the island, and keep it clean. Before the water rises in the rainy season in the Salar, they return home to their villages. Alfredo, Aurelia, and the two llamas stay behind. But was Alfredo really the first inhabitant of the island? The local historian knows the answer. The island's name is from the Inca language, Inca Wasi. Wasi means house. So it means something like house of the Incas. The indigenous people gathered in front of the offering and made the sacrifices at night. In this grotto, this cave, a ceremonial ritual was performed at night. So the cave was originally a refuge on the island, a sort of hostel. Previously, there was no accommodation here. The Incas and others came to sleep in the cave. It was a quiet place, a retreat like a hotel nowadays. In Western culture, white stands for the end. For us, it's the end of our journey through the white desert and through the light. America's Red Desert is monumental. Of course, there are these majestic landscapes elsewhere, in Central Asia, South America, and at the poles, but here they are accessible. The road to the gold and silver in the West left scars on the land. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln initiated the concept of national parks to preserve natural landscapes, but to accommodate the modern traveler, Today, they are crisscrossed by a network of roads. For more than 100 million years, the Colorado Plateau was an inland sea. Today, it is a red desert. The Colorado River that this desert is named after has cut so deeply into the earth that it can no longer water the land above. The views downwards are what make the southwestern United States spectacular. Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Colorado. The canyons and ravines in this Four Corners area are full of surprises and reveal bizarre rock and sandstone formations. Everyone knows the ultimate gorge, the Grand Canyon, a wild, red, yawning hole. Our journey begins there in the red heart of America, not at the familiar South Rim, but at a place yet to be discovered.
He who overcomes fear and walks the glass horseshoe on the West Rim is rewarded with a great never-before experience, a walk between heaven and earth. Why do we have this archaic fear of falling, actually? Or is it not archaic at all, but rather culturally conditioned? Wilifred Watanami from the Wallapai tribe asserts, you don't fall, you fly. What you see behind us, see this, this is um, the, the eagle behind us. The eagle to most American tribes is a symbol of honor, symbol of respect. But here in this area that we call San Juan or Eagle Point, the eagle, we believe um, the spirit of the eagle delivers the prayers of the people from the earth to the heavens. See, thus making it a very, a very special or a very sacred place. My uncle, he was a very spiritual man. And um, we always talked about, about this development here. And he actually gave the blessing for the groundbreaking of this uh, skywalk, even though he was one who was against it. But in talking with him, he always brought out the fact that, you know, this is something that's gonna affect us, you know, in our lifetime and not only us, the future generations. The sacred land itself has been here for ages and a uh, lot of people have lived here. The ones that was not uh, educated, the ones that didn't speak English, uh, they lived in Ahokan. And at that time, then uh, when the Calvary came through here, they were ambushed and a lot of our people just uh, died from all their gun wounds and been shot and killed and their bodies just blend right into the dirt. <laughs> Right at the beginning of our journey, Dolores Hunga confronts us with the conflict that dominates this area, the expulsion and extermination of the Native Americans by the white man. We know how this has been played down from the Westerns, the cowboy, and Indian movies. You know, Hollywood has stereotyped the Indian and the outsiders or uh, the visitors here. They still think uh, we're savage, we live in teepees, and uh, we're always at war with each other's or one another's and uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, like say most most natives you know they they take an offense to that but you know when they come into our areas you know we try to interact with them and to educate them and have them um, leave with a different impression of you know who and what we actually are the younger people, I guess they wanted to change, so they, uh, they went ahead and voted to have it put here. So, um, so it's here now, and nothing we can do about it is here. <laughs> so, but, but we like coming out here and performing. The preservation of the desert is linked with desert tourism. Almost everyone makes some money. Individually, like Elvira Otten, as musicians, artisans, guides, and service providers. Or collectively, the Wawapai opened their skywalk in 2007, the enormous power of nature tied to remarkable human achievement. North American deserts are rarely sandy, and indeed only 20% of all are sandy deserts, Weathered cliffs, gravel, and boulders are the most common, followed by gypsum, salt, and ice. The coral pink sand dunes are largely reforested. Only a small number of them reveal the precious coral windblown sand. What is sand, actually? Sand is a quantitative definition. A grain of sand can be between 0.06 and 2 millimeters in size. 
In addition to quartz, the most common sand, it can also be made of coral, lava, olivine, or gypsum. Sand can react as a solid, liquid, or gas. Sand tempts scientists to enlist the help of a fourth aggregate state. And it has various configurations. The ripple marks can be transverse, crescent, U-shaped, or in the form of a star, whichever way the wind blows. It looks like the small, dancing, round grains of sand rise up, pause a moment, then perform a playful somersault and lie down again. This dance is called saltation. I'm still driving down well-maintained highways flanked by rugged, high cliffs. 250 miles lie behind me, about 1,000 miles still to go. Then I turn on to an even less traveled road. Why is it so hard? How fragile this majestic landscape seems when you take a closer look. Broken and torn up, scarred, and deserted. In my air-conditioned capsule, I glide through intangible heat and loneliness. Three almost perfectly sculpted figures raise the curtain on another world. According to legend, there are people who have laughed at the coyote god. He turned them to stone as punishment, made hoodoos out of them. A wide-mouthed frog grins. Shriveled up masses glance about anxiously. Cephalopods are staring with their beady eyes. Legends, fairy tales, and science mix together when it comes to the explanation of the goblins. As I give into my imagination, my consulting geologist sticks to the facts. They are pillars of stone or uneven shaped rocks that have been unevenly worn by erosion and then processed. He can tone down my anxious question about whether the goblins and hobgoblins could disappear. Other rocks will be eroded and the next generation of hoodoos will replace them. On the way, I wonder, who really lives here? The motels we are headed for are abandoned. Restaurants have never existed. Way down below, I see, for the first time, Lake Powell, America's second largest man-made lake on the Colorado River. Here at the northern tip, 
Height's Overlook is deserted, and the town of Height marked on the map is little more than an access ramp to the lake. There is no lodge and no RV park, only a primitive camping site. All alone, I drive over a steel arch bridge. A lone cyclist is well on his way from New York to San Francisco. We nod wordlessly. For days, I cruise through endless red expanses and rarely meet anyone. I looked at the warning sign, but I didn't see it. And then I'm suddenly on the Moki Dugway, a winding road that the way it feels to me is pulling me straight down. My heart is racing as fast as my car. I've stopped breathing. The stone figure wearing a sombrero is small, but significant enough to give this place a name, Mexican Hat. The fact that Mexican Hat only has 88 inhabitants doesn't bother me. On the contrary, the intimacy of the lodge and the former dance floor, once the center of the village, gives me the feeling of security I need now. A fire and human warmth. It is not only the swing stake that gives me strength. The stay at the lodge is like a window to my own distant reality. The San Juan River winds its way through the desert a thousand feet below, an amazing and rare geological formation known as Entrenched Meander, the popular name Goosenecks. Native Americans control tourism here, as at the Skywalk. They had to fight to the death for many years to win an agreement with the U.S. government. The tribes collect entrance fees to the sites and determine the rules of the game. For example, strict prohibition of any photographs on or off the glass horseshoe or on the entire Hopi land. Almost 200,000 people live scattered around the Navajo reservation. Diné, the people, as they call themselves. They make their own laws. Many produce arts and crafts, woven blankets, silver jewelry, and baskets. Sally Black's baskets are popular with collectors as well as arts and crafts museums and galleries. I always wanted to be famous when I was about 10 years old, yeah. I was thinking, I want to see my pictures on the wall. With all this great basket, I wanted to be famous. I was still not a good weaver, but I pictured myself like that, and that was my dream. From collecting the sumac plant in the highlands to the transport, cutting branches to dyeing, washing, and braiding her work, Sally does it all herself. This is the only way for her to be able to control the quality of her craftsmanship.
my mom used to weave and that's the only way that she gets earning money and that's the only way that she feed us so she had 11 kids, seven boys and four girls. We had a big family, so I decided to help my mom in trying to learn how to earn money too. I always say that like when you have a job out there, you just have to go by time. But when you're at home, you just, you can take a break you weave the way you want it, you know, take your time. But sometimes when bills are coming, you just have to weave, you know, put more time. And so it's up to that. So for me right now, that's the only way I pay my bills. And when you keep weaving, like every, all day, by the end of the day, your thumb, your thumb's going to be all sore and the side all crack. So that's the reason why all the pain that we go through, we, we have to charge a lot for that. I usually sell it for like 1250 so that's what I usually do. Sally has mastered the traditional patterns and their color palette. Red symbolizes the sun. As Navajos, we use the basket for ceremonies. Um, that one is going to be our traditional ceremonial baskets. And the one that we use for decoration, this one like right here, this is called the Yebiche. This is going to be the Healing dancers, they usually dance in the winter, but it's going to be, it's just a halfway done. So it's going to be all dancing and that's, it's going to be about this big when it's done and it's going to be a little bit big. Sally prefers her mobile home to the Hogan. In the extreme climate of the desert, it has air conditioning in summer and heating in winter feels good being here. Live by Monument Valley, and it means a lot. My dad's side, my aunt, they own this land, and we asked them if we could live here, and they, we got permission to live here, and they said it's okay, so. Red is natural color to us. It's not red. It's natural color, like uh, close to beige color, light color. So red is like when it rains, you'll have like when you you can't wear white pants, white shoes, you'll get red and it won't come off. Even though you wash, it'll never come off. It'll stay red. That's how, you know, that's how it is out here. Lorraine Black, a relative of Sally, only uses her traditional Hogan for ceremonies. It is located directly in the tribal park. She rents it out to tourists as she prefers her prefabricated octagon. She shows us what a traditional Hogan looks like from the inside. This is nine post at Hogan. It represents a female, uh, female pregnancy, the woman. So that's why it's called female Hogan. This a Hogan is traditionally built round or square with logs, a windowless one-room hut, which is smeared with red clay, a fireplace in the center with an opening to the sky that is also a sundial. For spiritual reasons, the door is facing east. 
We still live without running water and electric because, you know, the park won't allow it. <laughs> it's just the way it is. They, they just want it to weigh the way it is, so it's like tour attraction. We're used to it, so we live like that. By the time the sun goes down, we're tired, we just go to sleep. And then we get up like in the morning, six o'clock feet of courses, and then we're ready to go on a tour again. Well, I live, live in, a, in town before. I, I had electric and the water, but you know, it was okay, but you know, you pay for electric and water. But here, it's different. It's more different and it's more likely not to have electric and running water, you know. It's not very important to us. Because, you know, if we did have it, we'll be struggling with, you know, running water, electric, paying for every month. You know what I mean? Lorraine's family is one of the last 11 families in Monument Valley. New permits to live or to graze their animals there won't be issued. Whoever wants to stay must accept the Spartan life. The Navajo government plans to use the park exclusively for tourism. Their son, Rodale Nelson, does work with them. He takes care of the horses used in the family business, but he lives outside the park with his girlfriend and two babies in Mexican hat. I was born and raised here, and I was raised by my grandparents. I dropped out of school, and I had that choice of becoming a carpenter, but it didn't happen for me. So I came back, and then that's how I got into horses. At first, I didn't know at all what horses. Slowly, I learned techniques from my dad. From my grandparents, what I learned is that you can't really go out, like, don't be out there too late. At night, there's, like, uh, people out there, skinwalkers, what we call them, that they can get onto you. That's their beliefs, and I just took their words. They're dressed as animals. They go crawl into the skin of an animal, and they'll be out there at night. I've never seen one, but who knows, uh, it might be true or not. <laughs> it's a mystery for me. Pretty happy. Free world out here. Nothing to be stopped from. And all these stars at night is pretty good too. If you look up into the sky, get to see the Big Dipper, Small Dipper, maybe also the Scorpio. All those, you know. Rodale seems to know every single mesa, butte, and pinnacle. This is where he feels at home. The history of the Mustangs will be that they belonged to the Spaniard once. They came across the sea and they used to fight here. But one day, the Indians, we were called Indians once, we cut the horses loose from them and we got the name Navajo from the Spaniards, which for them is Navajo as the knife people. Maybe in my death, you know, 
Just be with the horses. <laughs> be like a horse. In 1924, a fearless young white couple arrived in hostile Indian country. Harry and Mike Goulding lived in a tent for four years before they built a wooden house. They learned the new language, made friends, and worked together with the Navajos. In the Depression, they attracted the film industry and brought work and money to Monument Valley. And John Ford's Westerns, in turn, attracted the first tourists. The Navajos still speak with veneration of the Gouldings. On the way to the southern shore of Lake Powell, the Cowboy Motel beckons us to stop. What's behind the black and white silhouettes? A woman from Kansas purchased the dilapidated hotel a few years ago and decorated the rooms individually, lovingly, and with humor. Then the view of Lake Powell, of celestial beauty in the midst of a petrified country, a perfect lake in an ideal environment. But something is missing, vegetation. There isn't any road that goes around this lake, no tree-lined promenade, nothing growing, only additionally provided and filled in. A reservoir pumped full that has changed forever a part of the desert landscape of the Colorado Plateau, 96 canyons. I can only begin to imagine the sunken landscape of Glen Canyon. It's like I fly past a lake on the moon. No place in the world, you know, you find desert like this, this entire sandstone world with all this water around it. It's the, the contrast of the beautiful blue skies and the, the blue green water and the, the red sandstone. It's just visually stunning. And I've never found anything like it anywhere in the world. Steve Ward has dedicated his work and his life together with the Lake Globetrotter, Stan Jones, to the artificial lake. I definitely love the lake. I, I got to see the lake fill up. I got to see the lake the area before the lake, some of the, the beautiful places, some of the famous places. I was able to visit those when there was less than a foot of water in some of the places. And I watched them fill up and be covered. And I felt bad about that, but as the lake filled up those canyons, we explored farther back into the canyons and found beautiful places beyond there. A few years ago, Glen Canyon was largely unknown and mostly inaccessible. Today, 3.1 million people travel to Lake Powell annually, the star of the region. Any visitor who prefers privacy or even a houseboat can find his own bathing beach among the many inlets the lake has to offer. No, no mud. Good. It's beautiful. It gets really narrow, but straight down. The lake is not only a vacation paradise, it is a water resource. 90% of the water comes from the Rocky Mountains. Cities such as Phoenix, Los Angeles, and San Diego depend on Lake Powell for water. All the same, there are ongoing attempts by conservationists to drain the water from the artificial lake. Maybe it was wrong to build it, to, to, to make the lake, but it would be just as wrong to, to drain it. So I think two wrongs don't make a right. I don't think it will ever go away. Too many people rely on the water 
27 million people alone in the Los Angeles Basin. Our water is used over and over again, so what we swim in here, they're drinking in Los Angeles. The multi-layered soft Navajo sandstone, which surrounds the lake, consists of petrified sand dunes millions of years old. Its color ranges from beige to bright scarlet. When I look closely, I can see red spots caused by extremely high concentrations of iron oxide, also known as hematite. And that's what the Diné, the Navajo, call the red color even today, the blood of the living stones. Suddenly, a cave entrance and a dark fissure in the ground. You could easily miss Antelope Canyon. Inside, we penetrate deeply into a breathtaking rocky desert, a world of flaming waves, gentle curves, and bizarre sculpted underground tunnels, spirals in flesh-colored rock, a noise in shades of red to yellow to dark purple that by means of the incidental and reflected light changes in minutes and continually creates new worlds of wonder. Is this the red heart that pumps the blood of the living stones? The Slot Canyons. To locals, a slot is a dream world of swirling canyon walls that have been shaped over millions of years by water and wind. And still, the waters from an intense monsoon rain rush through the soft sandstone. Eddies whirl around, erode the sand, grind, and leave wavy patterns in the grain on the walls. Petrified whirlwinds, or a giant ice cream twist. They are, however, not innocuous. The narrow passageways, the entrances and exits that are difficult to access can, in case of a sudden downpour, become a lethal trap in seconds. Since the tragic flash flood in 1997 that literally whirled a group of tourists to death, it is no longer permitted to enter the canyon without a guide. A pity, because the visiting group disturbs the calm a calm you can read meaning into after a while, or hold dialogues with the luminaries. And again, my view is magically drawn downwards between the sandstone walls of the Canyon de Che in a 984 foot deep gorge is an elongated green oasis that was formerly used by 60 Navajo families as farmland.
Today, the Hogans are used more and more just as a retreat during the summer months. For ages, nobody has lived in the dwellings left behind by the former inhabitants, the Anasazi, which later offered the nomadic Navajos shelter. Whoever enters the Canyon de Che can say goodbye to paved roads, picnic and camping sites, and mobile phone reception. Tourism, from which now everyone in the region lives who doesn't want to be on welfare, is regarded as a necessary evil. The communication between locals and visitors is regulated or even prevented, and the chance to explore the canyon on your own is virtually impossible. The Canyon de Che, however, offers a stillness, an untouched quality we have rarely seen. Here down below, we find water, which permits the flourishing of life and traces of the desert varnish, the long eyelashes painted on the rocks, Russian olive, oak, cacti, and grass. The Canyon de Che, in retrospect, became one of the finest moments of our travels. The young people are like, uh, they don't very much like to tend to sheep anymore. As everything is modern today. TV, music, and that is more interesting than to them than, than sheep now. So it's like all the sheep are going away. So I imagine they'll be obsolete one of these days. Lamb is now sold in the reservation supermarket frozen, expensive, and imported from New Zealand. Kyle Mon doesn't think it replaces the tender meat of his own grass-fed animals. I still want to eat some mutton. Our body, it needs it. Like everybody needs a steak or something. So we tend to crave for uh, the mutton. We don't waste anything. Even the insides, the intestines, everything is used for food. Even the blood, we use it for sausage, blood sausage we call it. We eat even the, the head, all of it. We don't, we don't waste anything. And with the hide, we use it for uh, weaving, weaving rugs. And then we use them for uh, a bed, a bed pelt. <laughs> we butcher sheep. The arm will go to my mom for thank you for your cooking. And the other arm goes to my brother. Thank you for hauling water all the week. I knew you had other things to do, but thank you. And then the leg will go to me because I've been herding sheep all day, all week, all weekend. On our journey across sandy red roads, my car shrinks to the size of an ant. The colors are psychedelic and the dry air narcotic, and I'm one with the breathtaking solitude of the desert.
After an extensive look at Shiprock, the sacred mountain of the Navajo, I drive into Hopi land that is surrounded by the Navajo Nation, a reservation inside a reservation with nearly 6,000 inhabitants. We've got the rare permit to shoot there. Taking pictures is strictly forbidden among the Hopi. Ramson Lama Tawama explains why. It's not that we don't like people coming out here, but the preconceptions that they bring with them about Hopi uh, may not be so correct. We grew up here in a culture that recognizes two types of knowledge, basically. One we call common knowledge. Common knowledge is available to everyone. And then we have a, uh, an idea called privilege knowledge. And privilege knowledge can only be gained by going through uh, certain initiations. More knowledge is available, but it's only available to a limited group of people. And our culture tells us not to share of that part because that it's very sacred to us. The restriction is not only directed against outsiders. Even within the tribe, not everyone knows everything at any given time. <laughs> A child's rites may be announced, but their rituals remain secret until they are performed. The child is initiated, introduced into adult life. The Hopi also earn money with arts and crafts. I have chosen one that is based on sand. I've learned how to do some traditional arts, like carving kachina dolls. I was in my 40s when I learned how to blow glass. And when I look at glass art, uh, I look to the future. You know, I rely on my past and my history, but hot glass art is a very non-traditional Hopi art form. Uh, I believe I'm the first Hopi glass artist to begin blowing glass. So I look to my children, I look to my grandchildren and all the other people who are waiting to be born. Maybe a hundred years from now, we'll have a strong community of Hopi glass blowers too. Respect the past, learn from it, but involve the future. Hopi notions of time are fluid. They involve what exists, the same as what is coming or what has already been. The color red, as I understand it, is a directional color. It has to do with warmth. It has to do with heat. I tend to connect the idea of the sun and the color red. The color red can also be a color that alludes to warfare because warfare is connected to bloodshed. And blood obviously is red. So it all depends on what I'm thinking. Am I thinking blood or I'm thinking warmth? And I try to think warmth when I put the color into the glass. Ramson lives with his extended family on land that an uncle had passed on to him. Right now, they share a one-room container, but the larger house he has been building for years will soon offer more space for everyone. His workshop will be huge as well. He does everything himself, takes his time. Rushing about plays no role in his life. The piece that I just made, we call spirit figures and they're based on prehistoric rock art that we have here in the Southwest. They depict spirits uh, that would oversee or protect us. In addition to glass blowing, the whole family weaves, carves, and paints. They live from the meager crops. A cornfield on one of the three windswept table mountains, the mesas, presents a challenge. A vertebrae on the horizon, a long freight train glides silently across the landscape. Before my journey through the red desert comes to an end, I visit the painted desert. I don't know of any country that depends so much on light and moisture as this one. And once again, it is revealed only by looking downwards far below. You can almost miss it as you drive along the edge of the cliff.
Fleecy clouds float across the barren plain. The heavier they are and the closer they come to the ground, the more they reflect the red of the earth. The never-ending southwesterly wind blows up to 60 miles per hour that dries up everything. The attempt to measure it fails due to getting sand in the equipment. The Painted Desert, part of the Chinla Formation, is one of the least explored deserts of North America. And the uniquely preserved ancient meandering river delta even amazes geologists. From above, the land looks velvety and inviting, but the badlands can be vicious. Among the small rock fragments, which seem to be sitting on a pedestal, only the slightest moisture transforms the mudstone of volcanic ash into a vicious, slippery mud if you step or drive on it. Bentonite shrinks during drying like a sponge and expands when it gets wet. Completely barren, the country is vulnerable to erosion. I imagine how a giant painted the mountains with a giant brush. Geologically speaking, the different colored stripes provide information about the different types of deposits and stages of oxidation. Red, pink, and yellow have been exposed to the weather longer than blue and gray. Finally, Gallup, the Indian commercial center of the region, where we stop at the legendary El Rancho, the old movie star hotel from the days of the Western movies. Why is it so hard for you to love me? For you to love me? And once again, the sun sinks down in a red-hot sky. But now it takes its time. It struggles against dying, flares up, doesn't want to leave. And for us, too, it's hard to say goodbye. I've heard your sad story People say